Good morning, Stirring Church. We're going to have a great Sunday morning together. We're going to worship and dive into God's Word together. And thank you for tuning in. We're so excited to do this with you today. And our prayer, our heart, is that you would experience the presence of God wherever you're listening this morning. Hey, I want to invite you to something really fun that we do every year as a Stirring family. We gather at Enterprise Park on Monday evenings in May. We call it Mondays in May. Bring a picnic, come, fellowship, hang out, and listen. If you're new to our family, this is a beautiful place to come and meet people and gather. So I just want to make sure you all know about that because it's going to be a blast. We hope to see you in the park. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we ask that your presence would flow, that you, the life of Jesus would be in our worship and in the word. And Lord, I pray for everybody listening this morning that wherever they are, they encounter you in a new and fresh and powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward, and I just want to be just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you no matter how much the cost I'll freely give it all to you Jesus 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 my offering all my 
Hey, String family, we're going to bring our offerings. And as we do, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. One is our house offering. You've heard us mention a house offering a few weeks ago, but our house offering is essentially a 53rd offering that allows us to do more in our hearts as a stirring family than we could otherwise. So for this year, the intent of our house offering is to actually deepen our roots as we strengthen our discipleship systems. We want to expand our reach through our online platforms. So I want to challenge you as a part of our stirring online family to give and invest in our house offering. There's more information on the website. You can give by text to give. You can give online. You can write a check. If you mail us a check, just write in house offering in the memo. But I want to encourage you to partner with us in doing more that's in our hearts as a stirring family, in deepening our roots, in reaching the world around us in Jesus' name. Secondly, if you are a part regularly of our stirring online family, if this is what you would consider your church, I want to challenge you to give to support this. The text to give number on the screen clearly and directly enables you to give to helping us pay the expenses for the operational side of stirring online. It enables us to do this week in and week out. So if this is your church family, I want to challenge you to give in this way. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much for the way that you've given it in the past and will continue to do so. I bless you in Jesus' name. Let's give. Father, we are honored to be here today. Lord, we're honored at the opportunity that we have to so freely and openly dive into your word. God, what a gift to spend time in this book of Revelations, Lord, to... um, to read your story from your viewpoint, Lord, to hear a bit about the end again from your viewpoint. Father, to be the recipient in our day and in our age and in our culture and in our context of encouragement that you released to the churches thousands of years ago. Lord, and we just, we ask that you would, like John prayed, give us ears to hear. Father, we open up our ears to you. We listen to you. We open up our hearts to you. God, we ask that you would infuse us with strength, with deep courage, Father, with correction where we need it, and most of all, with just the awe and wonder of who you are. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be with you today and so good to be with our online family as well. We have been in quite the journey. We're in, we're in um, the book of Revelation and moving our way through the letters to the church. And this morning, we're going to skip around a bit. We've been going in order. We've done, Nate's preached on the first two, but we're going we're gonna to skip ahead today. Uh, to Revelation 3, verse 7, where John is writing to the church in Philadelphia. And the only reason why we're skipping his head is because I, I, this was my Sunday to preach, and this was my book to preach on. So we're landing in Philadelphia, and uh, I am so excited about this. I've never preached um, from Revelation before. And if I had to be honest with you, the whole idea of the book has pretty much terrified me since I was a little girl. Um, Having grown up in the church, I grew up with a lot of the very traditional church teaching that we most of us had if you grew up in the church. And Revelation was primarily a book to be avoided and ignored at all cost. Um, I was scared of it. I was scared of the, the imagery in it. I was scared of the message of judgment in it and the message of suffering that seems to come out of it towards the church. And so much of it doesn't make sense, right? And often what doesn't make sense to us and we can't control or manage, we feel afraid of. So I was definitely the little girl that went to bed sometimes at night going, Jesus, I love you, and I'm excited about heaven, but I want to die before revelation ever takes place. And if that's not in your will, at least let me grow up, get married, have kids, and be a grandma before it all happens. (laughs) Because maybe by then I'll have the fortitude to handle what I think is coming at me. (laughs) So it has been um, probably a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to sit under some teaching from... Brian Simmons, who wrote the Passion Translation, and he was teaching through his translation of Revelation, and it began to completely 
alter my understanding and how I viewed the book, uh, primarily because what he kept saying over and over and over to us again, and he showed it in, in Scripture, was revelation is not this terrifying book, but it is a revelation of the risen Christ. It is the, you know, a revelation of Jesus. And it's why he says over and over again in these first seven letters, each letter begins with a description of who Jesus is as the risen Lord. And, and then the parts about us in Revelation are constantly, we're referred to as the winning ones and the overcoming ones and the victorious ones and the radiant ones. And it began to just paint this different picture for me in terms of Revelation. So this morning, I am not afraid of this book and I'm not uh, looking for good news in it. I actually think it's overflowing with some really powerful good news for us today. So in fact, a uh, couple days ago, Jim, Jim and I and Eric were in the hallway at the church offices, and we were talking about what we were preaching through, which book we had, and kind of where we were headed with it. And we, we stopped, and we were like, John must be laughing up in heaven, giggling with glee. Like, can you imagine being the writers of Scripture and leaning down in heaven, leaning down from heaven, listening to our conversations, listening to our interpretations, listening to our understanding, and watching the way that it affects and impacts us today. You know, for as shocking as it would be for us to go back in time two or 3,000 years and live with them, they're watching us in our day, in our age, in our context, the great cloud of witnesses mentioned in Hebrews 11, leaning down from heaven, cheering us on, knowing that the word of God has this lifespan to it that never dims or dies or becomes irrelevant. But almost 3,000 years later, John's words and messages to the church through the power of the Holy Spirit are so applicable to us today. And I find that to be so true of this letter to the church in Philadelphia as well. So I want to give you a little bit of context because because of the imagery in this letter and in all the letters, I think it's really helpful for us to understand uh, just some of the historical context, some of the cultural context, it almost immediately begins to help the letter make sense. So a few things that I think are important for us to know about Philadelphia, um, it's obviously a really old city. It was actually built in the second century BC by King Eumenes, who built it and named it and dedicated it to his brother Philadelphus, which means the city of brotherly love, as you all know. Um, he was very loyal to his brother. They had a really close bond. And so as a king, he built and named and dedicated a city to his brother. So that's why... That's why it has the name that it has. It was built as a frontier town. When you actually look on a map, um, it was a border town, if you will. It was a frontier town. It was built as a missionary town in the sense that it was built to um, be a, a pillar and a glimpse into the beauty and the wonder and the awe-inspiring culture that Greek had. So it was the hope of the empire at that time that people that would come into the city from the frontier, from the farthest reaches of the empire, would come in and just be um, so in awe of Greek culture, and, and it was uh, meant to be kind of a sending place. So they were on the border of three regions, and one of those regions was a very barbaric region, and one of the other regions was the region of Lydia, and, and history shows that um, Philadelphia and kind of that strategy of the empire in terms of uh, missionizing, I don't know if that's a word, but like, you know, pro propelling their culture and, and who they were across the empire uh, was so successful that some of the surrounding cities within a matter of years had actually locked, lost their local language and had fully adopted the language of Latin, of Greece, and, and so immersed themselves in that culture. So Philadelphia was built as a kind of an outpost city, but when we think outpost, we think like Wild West streets, it was not that way. It was very much a refined city. It had, it had beauty. It had theater. It had a temple to it. It had some wealth to it. It was very cultural um, and very, uh, very, very much known for its sense of culture. So you have to kind of erase our American idea of a frontier town when I say that because it was very different. Um, it was surrounded by... Um, 
vineyards. It, it had just really rich, fertile soil. And so even historically, you can find historical references to wine made in Philadelphia. It was very famous for its wine. So the god of Philadelphia was Dionysius, which is the god of wine and revelry. Um, and you'll find, this, again, historical references to the, the vineyards in Philadelphia um, as you read through history. It was also a volcanic region, and this is really important to the study of this letter. Um, in AD 17, the whole city was decimated by a massive volcano, um, by a, a massive volcanic eruption. And it was so significant and so huge that they actually think it destroyed surrounding cities. And the whole region for decades experienced tremors and aftershocks from that earthquake. So for decades following, it's kind of like the Los Angeles of, of our time. Just was known for vol seismic activity that was very significant. It was so devastating and so consistent that residents of the city actually lived outside the city. They lived outside the city in homes and in huts and places like that because there was a constant fear of the buildings in the city falling in and destroying their homes. So residents didn't even actually live inside the city, the city realm. They lived outside the city. Typical to Philadelphia, as in all the other letters that we're studying, was just that blend, that really significant blend and, and influence of culture. Nate talked about it last week, where everything they did uh, had significance. You couldn't go to a barbecue without having to pay honor and homage in some way to a god. You know, you couldn't walk down a street without having to give nod to an altar that was set up or a god of the city or a god of the family. Or I mean, there was such a... Um, such a, uh, a wide sense of worship to many gods. And, and that, the culture at that time had such an emphasis on, on the divine. And when I say the divine, I don't mean the one true God. I just mean gods. So they worshiped everything they did. So Philadelphia was no different. There was a real, um, that was just very much a part of the culture that they lived in. Also in Philadelphia, there were traditional Jews. And you'll see in other references to other letters, you'll see the phrase like synagogue of Satan, uh, some really strong language. And what that means is it's referring to the traditional Jewish community in those cities, that they were, they were traditional Jews. They were Jews by culture, Jews by belief, but they did not believe in the Messiah. They did not believe in the risen Lord. They did not believe in Jesus. And they were holding to a traditional Jewish way of life. But even in Philadelphia, in this letter, John says they're not true Jews. They had melded and married and caved into the cultural pressure of the empire, and they, they enjoyed a bit of a protected status as a result of it. Because they had such an ancient religion, the Jews did, they had a measure of respect from those in the empire who also just respected the divine, and they respected anything that was connected to antiquity. So... Christians, early Christians, the early church, particularly in this city and in some of the other cities, were kind of between a rock and a hard place in terms of the traditional Jewish community that really aligned itself with the pagan community when it suited them. Um, and they, the traditional Jewish community also did not like the new church. They didn't like the early Christians. They were very much opposed to their belief system. They thought there was something uh, you know, that they had just kind of, um, they called it like an aberration to their own cultural views and beliefs. And so there was a lot of animosity and hostility towards the new church from the Jewish community. And in order to enforce and protect their way of life, they would align themselves with the pagan community to put pressure on the early church. And then there just was the pressure of their culture that they lived in. So and keep that in mind as we read through this. So Revelation 3, verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Similar to the other letters in Revelation, this one starts out with a description of Jesus. It says, these are the words of him who is holy and true. And if you were to read through each letter and write out that description of Jesus, you would just get this incredible 
picture of the risen Christ because each letter describes a different attribute of who Jesus is. And again, the comment that he is holy, he is separated, he is set apart, he is in a category all his own. That's what that word means in the Greek. And it's a reminder to the early church, he is not like the other gods you are surrounded with. He is set apart, he is holy, he is in a category all his own. And he is true, and that word true means he is real, he is authentic. It carries the idea of integrity. He is integrity. He is the very definition of integrity. And he is absolute truthfulness. Not just your truth, but he is absolute truthfulness. So John's reminding the church, the early church, you, the one that you have given your life, the one that, that you have honored and kept his name and stayed true. He is holy. He is set apart. He is different. He is unlike any other. And he is absolutely true. I love that each letter begins with these descriptions of Jesus because it calls us first and foremost not to a vision of the church, but to Jesus. Jesus and only Jesus. And we are called to recall him in that way. So much of what we do, even in church on Sunday, even as you're listening to this online message, we're talking about churches and we're reading messages to churches, but our eyes are always to be on him. And our vision is not to be filled with a vision of ourself, but a vision of him. And when we understand who he is, it informs who we become. And I think it's significant that each letter begins with this description of Jesus. He is holy and true. And then it says, he holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Jesus, if you, it's a fascinating study. If you have time, find out the keys that are on Jesus's key ring, because there are keys mentioned all through scripture and they're pretty amazing and powerful. But this particular one, he's saying he holds the key of David. It comes out of a phrase in Isaiah 22, 22. When you hold a key, when you have a key, what does it do? It opens a door. It opens a locked door. It gives you access to a restricted or a locked place. So Jesus has keys, and this particular key is the key of David. It's the key of authority. It's the key of rulership. It's the key of the, it's a key of the kingdom. And then it goes on to say, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. So when Jesus opens a door, Nobody can shut it and nobody else can open. There are doors that only Jesus can open and there are doors that only he can shut. So it's this reminder to the church of God's supremacy of Jesus' supremacy of his ultimate power and his ultimate authority. And there's this undercurrent of no matter, no matter the powers that you are sandwiched in between and maybe the sense of your access or your influence being limited because of who you're sandwiched which between the pagan community and the traditional Jewish community, there are still doors of opportunity that when the Lord opens them for you, nobody else can open those doors. It doesn't matter who they are or what kind of power and influence they have. When Jesus opens a door, he opens a door and nobody can shut it. And then he says, I know your deeds. And I have to confess, when I first read these, and this is probably just insight into me, um, I, I always read them with like this tone of judgment, like Jesus, like, I know your deeds, you know, the mom, the mom voice, like, I know what you're really up to. <laughs> um, and I just heard the Holy Spirit go, you need to change your tone of voice while you're reading this letter. So, and I'm like, okay, he goes, read it again. And I did, he goes, I am pulling the gold out of my church. I know your deeds. I, I have walked among the seven lampstands in the beginning of the book. I have walked among my church. I walk among my church. I love my church. And in this sense, I am coaching them. I'm bringing out the gold in them. I know from personal experience with them who they are and what they've done. And it's filled with this like, coaching sense, you know, like I know what you've done and I also know what you're capable of. And so what follows in this particular letter is I'm going to bring out more. I'm going to ask you for more. I'm going to push you for more, but I know you and I know that you can do this because of who I am. I am holy and true. And when I open up a door, nobody else can shut it. 
Um, so I have placed before you an open door nobody can shut. He goes on to say, I know you, and I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. You have to understand that because they were a border town, remember, they were a frontier town, they understood the symbolism of an open door. They understood that what Jesus was saying to them was, I am asking you to extend your influence. I am asking you to move through an open door. I'm asking you to extend my kingdom. I'm asking you to go forward. I'm asking you to go through something. And he says, I understand that you have little strength. And that word doesn't mean weak, like you're weak and ineffective. It means a limited influence. The other thing about the city of Philadelphia was that it was connected and under the jurisdiction of a larger city. So it was not as powerful as some of these other cities. So even as a city, it had limited influence compared to the other cities. As a church, the early church compared to the pagan community and the traditional Jewish community, they did not have a lot of influence. And Jesus is recognizing that. He's recognizing that their physical reality is this. But he's telling them, I have the keys. I have put before you an open door. And when I open it, nobody can shut it. And he's telling them the spiritual reality that you live in is different than the physical reality you are experiencing. And he says, you have the ability, in other words, you have the ability to walk through the door that I am opening. You have the ability to walk through this door, to carry influence, to be agents of change. And it's not dependent on your size or your status or the strength of your influence. Because why? Because I am the one that is holy. I am in a category all by myself. I am true. And when I open a door, nobody can shut it. Amen. Amen. We, the, the gift, the message, the reminder to us in this is that we live in both of those realities as well, right? How many of you know that and experience that? We live in a physical reality and we live in a spiritual reality. And if you're not fully convinced of that, all I want to call your attention to is the cross. The cross is a physical reality. The crucifixion of Jesus actually happened. It was a physical activity that actually happened that had spiritual repercussions that still vibrate through our time and day. You and I are who we are because of the cross of Christ. So we live in the tension of a physical reality and a spiritual reality. And as followers of Jesus, when we are connected to him, which we are as followers of Jesus, our spiritual reality with him always trumps the physical reality that we live in. Always. That's how transformation happens. That's how you can walk through an open door and bring change to places that you go because you are a son and daughter of God. And when he calls you to walk through an open door, it's for something, right? Doors of opportunity. How many like doors of opportunity? We all like doors of opportunity. And that's really what John is saying to this church through Jesus. I have opened a door before you. They understood the imagery. They, meant, they understood that it was meant to extend, to bring influence, to influence the culture around them. So there's this door of opportunity before them. What's interesting and fascinating, N.T. Wright says this about heaven and about those two realities that we live in. Heaven's answer to the abuse of power and the stubbornness of humanity to do things their own way, heaven's answer is not to pull up the drawbridge, withdraw, or provide backstair access for those who can escape. Which, how many of us grew up, I grew up in a church that kind of believed that. Like, we're going to withdraw from culture. We're just waiting for the second return of Christ. Like, and we've got the free ticket out of here. So we've got back stairs. We got access to those back stairs and we're going to slip out the back door and escape. But N.T. Wright says, actually, heaven's answer is to reassert the claim of God, the one who was holy and true over all of his creation. And that's what John is saying to this church. I've put before you an open door. And your mandate, the call, is for you to reassert the claim of God over all of creation. Yeah. The one who was holy and a category all above, yeah. right? That's the claim that you're reasserting, and he is true. He is absolutely true. 
And that's our mandate still to us today, not just the church in Philadelphia, but to you and I, that we are to move forward and establish and reassert the claim of God in every place that he gives us an open door. A funny story for me about that, and I, I've, I've been talking to the Lord. I talk to the Lord periodically about this because my whole life really is church and followers of Jesus. And I, I'm not connected in very many places or contexts with people outside of church or outside of Christians. And so every once in a while, I'll pause and just go, Lord, would you, again, open up my eyes if there's people in my life or my world that you want me to reach out to with the gospel of Jesus like you know, help me do that. So, and, and I have failed miserably twice now, just, just in case you want to know. Um, recently, I was in Starbucks and I had on a hoodie because we here at the Stirring, we like our hoodies, right? And I had on a Stirring hoodie. I had on my Rev and Ref hoodie. Um, and it's super cool. And I can't at this moment remember what it says on the back, but it says something on the back. And I'm standing in line at Starbucks and this woman comes up to me and she goes, I really like your hoodie. What does it mean? And I was in a hurry, because I always am. I was in a hurry, and I just was like in a different zone. And I didn't really want to talk to her about it. And I just sometimes kind of shrink back, honestly. Like, ah, they don't really want to know. They're going to shut down the instant I say anything about it being Jesus, God, or church. So I'm like, oh, it's just, it's a hoodie from a class I'm, I'm helping to lead. And I kind of brushed her off. And I thought she would just be like, oh, whatever. She, and I got my coffee and I walked out the door as she goes, oh. And I could hear the disappointment in her voice. I'm not exaggerating. And I walked out the door and I got in my car and I was like, shoot, I missed a door of opportunity. What's interesting about that phrase, door of opportunity, is it actually translates, it is right in front of your face. That the Greek says it's a door right in front of your face. My mom would say, if it's a snake, it would bite you. It was like that in Starbucks, though. Fast forward, just a few weeks ago, I'm in Safeway with my Emerge hoodie on, and it doesn't actually say anything on it. It's just a cool hoodie with three trees, and it says Emerge. And the lady bagging my groceries goes, oh, that's a really cool hoodie. Where'd you get it? And I'm like, aha, I'm not going to miss the opportunity. Um, so I'm stumbling through it a, a bit. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a movement that I lead at our church that pairs people up with mentors. And, and she was not nearly as interested as the Starbucks lady, but at least I tried, right? A door of opportunity right in front of your face. He goes on to say, he goes on to say, he opens up doors for us uh, where, where they've been restricted. So even there's this sense of when there's a restricted or locked access, God will put something in front of you and go, now is the time where you've been restricted, where it's been locked, I'm opening up that door. And all through Revelations, right? We are the winning ones. Nate talked about that last week. We are the winning ones. We wear the winner's crown. We are the victorious ones. We are the overcoming ones. And when he opens up a door, we're, we're guaranteed victory, maybe not in our sense of it, but we're guaranteed victory for the sense that he released us to walk through that open door. Verse 12 says, to the one who is victorious, and I want to pause on this word real briefly here. Um, <clears throat> he says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is to come. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. I just want you to hold in your mind for a minute that word, the one who is victorious. We read it as past tense. It is not past tense in the Greek. It is the one who is being victorious, the one who is in the process of gaining victory, the one who is winning and will keep winning. So it's got this current tense to it. And I, I want you to just hold that in your mind because then he goes on to say, um, I will, the one who is victorious, the one who is winning, the one who keeps winning, the one who is in the process of winning, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will you leave it. I will write on the, I will write 
on them the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. So he's promising, interestingly enough, to the church at Philadelphia that they're going to be a pillar. This is significant. Remember, they were in a community that was constantly shaking and they didn't live inside the city. They lived outside the city. But he's saying, I'm actually going to establish you in a place. I'm going to establish you as a pillar in a town temple. This is incredible. This is, I could preach like two or three sermons on this. What do pillars do? They hold up a roof, right? Pillars hold up a roof. It bears the weight of a roof. Pillars and the roof create space between the roof and the floor for life to happen right? So I'm establishing you as a pillar. I'm establishing you to be somebody that holds space. That's kind of a, a, a common phrase right now, like I'm going to hold space for you. God's saying, I'm establishing you as a pillar to hold space. Because why? And where? I'm, I'm asking you to hold space in the temple. What was significant about the temple? The temple in, in, in every culture, in traditional Jewish culture, in this culture, the temple is the place where the reality of heaven and the reality of earth overlap, yeah. Yeah. right? So I'm establishing you as a pillar in my temple. You're going to hold space in the place where the reality of heaven and the reality of earth overlap. The reality that we live in, right? Because we live in a spiritual reality and a physical reality is that while he's, he's establishing us as a, as a pillar, we are already the temple. We are already the temple where Jesus dwells. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are the temple of the Holy Spirit? So we are established as a pillar to hold space in the place where the reality of heaven, which is us, we bring the reality of heaven to the reality of earth. And we don't just hold empty space, but it's space filled with the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the reality that he is holy and he is true. And you can come into the space and I'm going to tell you about Jesus and I'm going to tell you about my God and I'm going to tell you about who you are. You are, you are named in the family of God. You have belonging and you can have a place of citizenship and a place of rest. So we invite people into that place. We being both the pillar and the temple become the place wherever we go through the open door that brings the reality of heaven to meet the reality of earth. As pillars, we are unshaken. We uphold the reality of heaven, creating space for kingdom life to grow and flourish. So all at once, we're a pillar and a temple walking through an open door, creating space and holding space for the kingdom of heaven. And he says, to the one who is in the process of overcoming, to the one who is in the process of overcoming, I will give you the name of my God. Well, the name of Jesus is God, is Father. So we are given a family name. And this is both a current promise, a now promise, right? We're in the family of God, and it's a future promise. I will give you the name of my God. We are given a family name. We are invited into belonging. I will write on you the name of the city where my Father dwells. We are given citizenship into a kingdom. So we belong to a family. We belong to a place. And then he goes on to say, and I will give you my new name. Jesus is going to be given a new name at some point in the future. And, and what that means is that all of the glory and all of the majesty and all of the beauty that Father bestows on the risen Christ at some point down the road, Jesus turns around and just shares it with us, which is what he's done all along. So the invitation to us in this is a couple things. One, we, like the church in Philadelphia, need to be faithful to him. It says that they were faithful to him. They kept his word and they acknowledged his name. So Father, keep us faithful. Give us the grace to be faithful. We repent for being unfaithful when we need to do that. The second thing is some of us need to recognize that there is an open door right in front of our face. And when God puts an open door in front of you, it cannot be shut. All are called to do the work of the gospel. All are called to bring the gospel. For some, it is the labor of their lives. And that may be an invitation that God is asking you to consider with him. 
And the last is just merely a strong word of encouragement. Continue to be the overcoming ones. The, you get to be in process. We actually are supposed to always be in process. You get to receive the grace of being in process. Some of you might need to get in the process. You might need to commit to that process, but you also get to receive from Him the grace of being in process and receive the claim that He has laid on you, that you belong to Him, you bear His name, and He invites you to live with Him. Amen? Amen. Amen.